Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the last of this year's Proteomics webinar series where we're joined by two new speakers, Isabel Bloodow and Andreas Daminau, alongside our guest chair for today, Karen Colwell. Our speakers will be giving us insights into their work in the field of protein-protein interactions and Karen will then chair the question and answer session and roundtable discussion with our speakers. Karen works at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute in Toronto and coordinates large-scale projects and collaborations in Tony Porson's lab there. Her work is centred on understanding how signals origin from outside the cell are interpreted by components within the cell to generate the appropriate cellular response. This cellular response is dictated in a large part by the interactions between proteins that are dynamically organized into vast networks and how aberrations within these networks can lead to complex uh, diseases such as cancer. And so her expertise in this area will make her a fantastic chair for the, the following discussions. Um, as usual, um, I have a, some of the housekeeping points to go over before handing over to the first of today's speakers. So we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussions, so please join us there, ask questions, share any thoughts and discuss the work and use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered. It also then allows our speakers to answer other questions or follow up after the talks are finished. And as we have multiple speakers today, please direct your questions by naming the speakers when you type them in. For those of you who need an attendance certificate for this webinar, the details will be available on how to get this after the last slide. So once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young, Investigators, uh, Young Proteomics Investigators Club, the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network and the News and Proteomics Research Blog for promoting this event. We're also grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with webinar support. And thanks to our YouTube channel subscribers and all the talks today will be available to watch again online. And also thanks to Matrix Science who have sponsored our challenge uh, with YPIC today. And of course, thank you for our speakers for giving their time. So yeah, as many of you know, before today's webinar, we shared the fourth of our Young Proteomics Investigators Club mini challenges sponsored by Matrix Science for you to test your de novo skills and manually sequence the spectra provided. Today is also the grand prize challenge of £100. So the winners and solutions will be provided at the end end of the webinar from our colleagues at YPIC, so stay tuned. So now I'll introduce the first of today's speakers, Dr. Isabel Bloodow from the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Munich. So Isabel is a postdoctoral researcher in Matthias Mann's lab, and during her PhD with Rudy Abbasold at ETH in Zurich, Isabel contributed to the development of software for analyzing large-scale data-independent acquisition and mass spectrometry data sets. She specifically focused on computational strategies for detecting and quantifying protein complexes from the data generated by native cofractionation coupled to DIA. In her postdoctoral research, Isabel studies molecular signaling pathways mediated by post-translational modifications and their crosstalk. Today, she's going to speak to us about the complex-centric protein profiling by SexSwath MS for the detection, parallel detection of hundreds of protein complexes. So it's over to you, Isabel. Don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present uh, uh, some of my work here. And um, as uh, Joe kindly introduced, I'm today talking about complex-centric proteome profiling by sex -Swath ms And this is work that I've been doing during my PhD in uh, Rudy Ebersold's lab at ETH Zurich. So to introduce um, the... Um, topic of my presentation today, I'd like to start off with this representation of how cells generate molecular diversity along the axis of gene expression. And um, as you know, uh, cells start off with a repository of uh, something like 20,000 uh, genes, which um, get expanded to hundreds of thousands of uh, transcripts, which in turn are translated to millions of proteins and proteoforms. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, our proteomic studies um, actually stop um, at the proteome level. But the um, seminar today and uh, also in my talk, um, I will focus on the interactome and um, specifically I will describe a strategy that we developed in the Ebersold lab to confidently detect and quantify protein complexes in a systematic way and on a proteome-wide scale. 
And I will also uh, briefly um, touch on um, aspects of how we can extend this strategy to assess quantitative differences um, in protein complex assemblies across conditions, and also briefly highlight uh, possibilities to look at proteoform specific uh, assemblies. So the underlying technology for um, the um, strategy that we de developed is based on protein cofractionation mass spectrometry, which is uh, depicted here in the slide. So the first step in this um, protocol is that you perform a mild cell lysis, which keeps protein complexes intact. And these co complexes are subsequently um, uh, separated um, by, uh, for example, size exclusion chromatography, SEC, or ion exchange chromatography. And um, the, but the basic principle is that you use some biochemical property to separate the complexes and fractionate um, across the separation dimension. Each of the sampled fractions is uh, then used to, um, to process and analyze by bottom-up mass spectrometry. And what you then get at the end um, is basically a quantitative uh, data matrix of the proteins in each of the sampled fractions. And if we look at this from the chromatographic dimension, you can see quantitative protein profiles along the fractionation dimension, where you will see that proteins that form a stable complex nicely coelude together along the fractionation dimension, as shown for these two toy complexes here. So the benefit of um, these cofractionation strategies, uh, as for example, compared to other strategies such as affinity purification, coupled to MS, is that it's um, largely independent from genetic engineering or the availability of specific antibodies. And you can, in, uh, in uh, principle, um, in parallel detect hundreds of protein complexes on a protein-wide scale in a, just a single experiment. So the um, most common strategy that is established for analyzing such cofractionation MS data sets is um, something that is often referred to as protein correlation profiling, where uh, proteins are scored in a pairwise fashion. And uh, then you perform some clustering approaches to um, uh, for the de novo identification of protein complexes in such data sets. So while this approach works extremely nice in theory, there are several technical um, challenges that uh, limit the sensitivity and selectivity of these de novo strategies. Well, first of all, um, the situation is much more complicated than in the example uh, exemplary representation at the top, um, because we are actually analyzing thousands of proteins simultaneously, and the and this coupled with the limited key, uh, peak capacity of chromatographic separations to date, um, this basically results in the effect that a lot of proteins randomly coelude along the fractionation dimension, although they are not actually in a um, complex together. And this then results in limited selectivity and sensitivity of these pairwise um, scoring approaches. So other laboratories have um, tried to uh, tackle this challenge by, for example, applying multiple orthogonal fractionation um, uh, technologies and to integrate the data at the end. Um, however, in the Eversoid lab, we try to approach this challenge from a different perspective um, by introducing a new targeted analysis strategy. And uh, we call this uh, complex centric proteom profiling by Sexworth MS. And um, the basic um, three advances in the strategy um, compared to the standard cofractionation MS uh, experiment or setup are that first of all uh, we use um, high, a high resolution size exclusion chromatography setup where we sample between 60 and 80 fractions. Um, we then uh, use DIA or Swarth mass spectrometry to get highly complete quantitative data matrices from the bottom-up proteomics measurements. And finally, um, the key aspect is that we uh, use a targeted analysis strategy where we make use of prior information, for example, present in protein complex databases such as Corum or StringDB, and uh, specifically target these protein complexes to find uh, evidence for these complexes in our data. And this significantly increases the sensitivity and selectivity of protein complex detection. So um, if you uh, look at this uh, um, analysis approach, it's actually an extension of the peptide-centric DIA analysis strategy, 
um, where um, in peptide-centric DIA analysis, we use a spectral library to uh, query um, our highly multiplexed uh, DIA or swath windows um, for specific fragment ions, which we can then extract to find specific um, fragment ion collusion peak groups along the C18 retention time dimension. Now in complex-centric proteome profiling, we don't use a spectral library, but something very similar, which we, um, where we use prior knowledge from these quorum com uh, complex databases such as quorum. And uh, we now uh, go into the multiplex sec fractionation data and extract only protein profiles um, in our um, complex database, and uh, then try to find protein collusion peak groups in the sec dimension. And uh, now uh, this basically determines that we have evidence for the queried complex in our data. So uh, what we have done is basically implement this complex-centric uh, data analysis strategy along with um, several pre-processing steps and also a decoy-based uh, complex-level FDR estimation strategy in an R package called a CC profiler, which is openly available on GitHub. And uh, if you are interested, in um, probably like trying out some sex swath MS workflow yourself. We have alongside our original publication um, also uh, recently published a step by step protocol, um, which guides you through uh, all the experimental and also computational analysis uh, steps that are necessary to perform a successful experiment. So in the next uh, couple of slides, um, I'd like to uh, show you some examples of uh, how you can use complex-centric proteome profiling um, and uh, what, we, what information we could retrieve from analyzing a single um, uh, sample of uh, soluble HEC293 cells. And um, in this single experiment, we could uh, overall detect uh, evidence for 572 complexes um, out of all the complexes annotated in the quorum complex database. And importantly, uh, when comparing this to a manual annotation, uh, this um, uh, corresponds to a 90% sensitivity as a, at a 5% false discovery rate. On top of uh, detecting or being able to detect these holo complexes, um, CC Profiler and our analysis strategy can also um, derive information about subcomplexes and uh, protein complex assembly intermediates. So what you can see on the figure on the right side now are quantitative protein profiles for all the subunits annotated in the proteasome in quorum. And uh, the x-axis corresponds to the sec fractions um, uh, where early fractions um, correspond to a high molecular weight, so the large complexes elute in the early fractions, whereas uh, smaller complexes or the monomers elute in the later sec fractions. On the y-axis, you see the protein intensity, and uh, each of the black vertical lines corresponds to a protein complex signal as determined by CC profiler. So what you can see here is that um, the, the the signal furthest to the left, uh, the highest molecular weight signal, uh, actually contains all of the proteins uh, annotated to the proteasome, and this corresponds to the peak for the whole 26S proteasome complex. The slightly lower molecular weight peak here um, only contains all of the um, alpha and uh, beta subunit proteins, and uh, this corresponds to the 20S proteasome complex. What you can see is that we also did automatically detected several um, peaks in the lower molecular weight range, and we were interested in whether this, these actually correspond to um, some biological signals. And um, to investigate this, um, we um, added some known uh, proteasome assembly, uh, assembly chaperones to the analysis, and these chaperones are here on the left highlighted in uh, yellow, black, and red. And what you can nicely see is that uh, these assembly chaperones co-elute uh, exactly with the alpha and beta subunits. And uh, this, um, this basically indicates that uh, these lower molecular weight signals really correspond um, to the early and late proteasome assembly intermediates. And what I think this really nicely um, illustrates is that uh, we can uh, get incredible resolution and uh, get mechanistic insights even in these large-scale experiments. 
So on top of this uh, information on, on specific protein complexes, we can also use the sex as data to evaluate some global proteome assembly characteristics. And for this, uh, we can leverage the log linear relationship between the sec fractionation dimension and the molecular weight. And this enables us to, for each protein, um, div uh, divide the sec dimension, uh, sec fractions into an assembled and to a monomeric range. And if we, for a protein, uh, see the elution along the sec dimension, we can um, distinguish uh, protein elution in the assembled versus the monomeric range. And this analysis enabled us to, uh, to figure out that 66% of all the detected proteins in this experiment actually have at least one elution peak in the assembled range. On top of this, we can also evaluate if a protein has multiple distinct peak groups along uh, the fractionation dimension. And here we could see that 27% of proteins elute multiple times along the sec dimension, which indicates that they potentially um, contribute to different complexes and also might perform different functions in the cell. So um, these uh, three um, basic uh, analysis steps are the ones that uh, we investigated or, and highlighted also in our um, recent protocol. But of course, uh, on top of just being able to investigate a single um, condition, it's um, probably even more interesting to investigate how uh, protein complexes might rearrange and change in abundance across conditions. And um, one initial um, uh, application where we uh, tried this was um, Moritz Heusel's publication earlier this year, uh, where um, we investigated protein complex and pr uh, protein rearrangements uh, in the cell cycle where HeLa CCL2 cells were blocked uh, either in interface or mitosis and sex mass experiments were performed in either condition. And um, in the next slide, I'm just showing uh, one example for all the protein subunits of the BRCA1 complex which where you see that uh, all of the subunits of this complex are fairly low abundant in interface, but they increase significantly in abundance during mitosis, showing that this complex is actually nicely uh, increased in abundance during mitosis, which is known. So um, one uh, final very exciting um, aspect uh, that can be um, evaluated from sex MS data um, is proteoform specific assembly characteristics. And when I'm talking about proteoforms, I'm talking about uh, protein variants from the same gene locus that have a unique amino acid sequence and post-translational modifications. And um, commonly, the challenge in bottom-up proteomics is that proteoforms can actually not be detected in these, this data because uh, of the loss of information which peptides belong to which uh, parental protein. And, um, but here in the sex mass data, we can actually leverage the additional chromatographic dimension to look uh, to perform a peptide level analysis to group peptides into groups of um, co-varying co um, uh, co profiles. And uh, here I just show an exemplary uh, peptide level uh, profile for the nuclear autoantigenic sperm protein. And uh, here, each of the lines uh, now not don't correspond to a protein, but to a peptide of uh, the NASP protein. And um, we developed together in, with a, in a collaboration with uh, Hannes Rust in Toronto, actually uh, an automated strategy to group peptides into proteoform groups. And uh, here, the colors of the peptides indicate um, highlight which like the two different proteoform groups that were determined for the NASP protein. And what you can appreciate is that all of the orange peptides um, contribute to uh, both of the elution peaks uh, shown for this protein, whereas the blue peptides only elute in the higher molecular weight peak. And if we now map all of these peptides back to the original protein sequence, you see that all the pep blue peptides correspond to uh, a defined region in the center of the protein. And mapping this back to the annotated splice isoforms of, um, of the NAS protein, we could confirm that um, the higher molecular weight peak corresponds to the long splice isoform, while the lower molecular weight peak only contains uh, sequence regions of the smaller short isoform. 
So at this point, I now would like to get into two more um, technical uh, questions uh, of the workflow, um, but I keep it a little bit more brief. So the first is the question why um, we, uh, we insist on using DIA for complex centric proteome profiling. And um, the a simple answer is that in, uh, at least in our hands, uh, DIA um, both uh, um, achieved much higher consistency and identification and also higher uh, quantitative precision. And uh, this subsequently resolved, uh, resulted in uh, a much better uh, protein, uh, performance in the complex centric uh, analysis where we uh, um, basically could detect almost uh, double the number of protein complexes in DIA compared to side by side DDA measurements. The second aspect that I'd like to briefly talk about um, is one of the major bottlenecks that we still see in um, the broad scale adaptation of sex for ms which is uh, the fairly expensive and um, uh, long protocol that is um, required uh, in the original procedure, uh, which <clears throat> takes about one week of MS measurement time for measuring a single replicate and condition. And um, to kind of uh, tackle this challenge, um, together with several colleagues in the Eversoid lab, we worked on a much uh, more rapid workflow where we're now using the EvoSAP short gradient of 21 minutes only. And uh, this enables us now to perform one uh, single sex fourth MS experiment in only one day. And what you can see in the bar charts on the bottom is that although uh, reducing the gradient so significantly, uh, we lose some peptide and protein identifications, we still are able to recover almost all of the protein complexes. So with this, um, I'm uh, coming to the uh, con conclusions or the wrap up of uh, my uh, presentation. So I hope that I could um, convince you that the novel complex centric um, analysis strategy in combination with sex fourth ms uh, enables um, us to consistently detect and quantify a lot of protein complexes on a protein wide scale. And um, uh, I think especially now with the prospect of uh, using uh, much shorter uh, gradients and being able to perform uh, the analysis much faster, we can now uh, make it feasible to perform large quantitative comparisons um, uh, of protein complexes across conditions. And finally, um, uh, I presented a quick teaser on something I'm very excited about, which is the proteoform specific uh, information on protein complex level that we can um, achieve in these sex worth MS uh, data sets. So with this, um, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. And I'd like to specifically thank uh, Moritz Häuser, who um, spearheaded the uh, sex worth MS workflow in uh, Rudy's lab. And uh, I worked with him very closely on uh, on this project and uh, he also generated most of the data that I presented today um, I'd also of course like to thank Rudy Ibersold for uh, his supervision during um, the presented work and during my PhD and all of the other uh, Ibersold lab members that were involved in the projects and uh, I'm very happy to discuss uh, the pro uh, project even more in our roundtable discussion at the end. Great. Thanks, Isabel. Great talk. Um, just for everyone listening, don't forget to direct your questions to Isabel on the Slack channel um, and we'll be um, answering all of those uh, after the second talk, which leads me on to introduce today's second speaker is uh, Andreas Damenau from the Target Discovery Institute at the University of Oxford. So Andreas studied at the University of Leicester for both his bachelor's and master's degree in infection and immunity, and then he moved to Glasgow for the uh, his PhD, where he focused on identifying and characterizing uh, Leishmania D ubiquitinase enzymes. He's now a postdoc in the lab of Benedict Kessler at the Nuffield uh, Department of Medicine in Oxford, where he's currently using proximity labeling techniques to reveal the possible role of dubs in both cancer and immunity. And today he's going to speak to us about the profiling dynamic KRAS interactomes via optimized Apex2 proximity labeling. So it's over to you, Andreas. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, perfect. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work today. So I will uh, mainly focus today 
to introduce proximity labeling, APEX2. And I will try to show the ability of this technique to capture some dynamic interactions. And I will use as reference uh, KRAS. So initially, I need to spend some time to introduce KRAS biology. So KRAS is a really well studied oncogy and it's in GDPases. As in GDPases, it has two stages. It has an active and inactive stage. In the inactive stage is bound to the GDP, where in the active stage is bound to the GTP. So here is really easy example how this can be activated. We have an external signal that it will cause the dimerization of a receptor, recruitment of KRAS. It will be activated and then obviously it will come close to many of the already known effectors and it will have a signal transduction which eventually affects many aspects of the cells, including proliferations. So we decided to try to use Apex2 labeling, which I will introduce in the next slide, how it's actually work. Just briefly here, I need to point out that it's an enzyme. And as an enzyme, we need to have a substrate. In our case, it's biodinphenol. And in the presence of H2O2, we have a catalyst of the reaction, which will cause a free radical. And this free radical will be able to interact and bind to any protein that is close to your bait, to your Apex2 at the time. So then you can use a streptavidin bits to pull down and then obviously mass spec to identify the proteins that you you uh, you biodinylate. So we decided to use Keras as a starting point because it's a, a well-studied protein. So we have already a lot of proteins that we already know that is interact with Keras. So we can validate this technique and see how strong it is. And at the same time, we expect that we may identify some unique new interactions uh, partners of Keras. So as I already pointed out, it's a proximity labeling. Apex is a proximity labeling. So this means that you have a radius that it will be able to biodinylase any proteins that are close to your bait, which is uh, is around five to twenty nanometers. Uh, now, obviously, this is really nice schematic presentation, but uh, we know that it's not so simple in actual uh, life. We know that inside the cell is much more dense environment. We have a lot of proteins. And most of those proteins, they will be close to Keras, but it doesn't mean that they actually interact. It will be just background. A really good example to explain that. Uh, imagine that we was in the before COVID-19 era. I would be in London, would be in a lecture theater where I would give uh, that talk. And if I was interested to see which participants they are actually in the room, I could take my phone and take a selfie. And then I can look the picture and I can distinguish the people that they actually participate to the talk. So this is how uh, Apex2 is working. You have the bait, which in our example, it's myself. I have the Apex2, which is my phone. And I just capture a snapshot of what is happening around me. In the case, or in the example that I gave, in my case, I can easily distinguish the people. But in the photo, there will be still some objects, some tables, some chairs, many other things that they are just background. It's not, I don't interact with them. I don't, I don't present them to them. They're just there. So the same it can happens in the Apex 2, and actually it will be much more the background compared to the real interactors. So for that case, it's really important to be able to find a way to distinguish those background with the real interactor partners. And if you don't design well your experiment, it will be really hard uh, when you do your data analysis. So here we decided to use a trick. So as I already pointed out, we have Keras inactivated version and Keras activated versions. So we thought that if we, if we can do the Apex to proximity labeling in both inactivated and activated, we can use one of the other to remove the background and we can see the enrichment of some products that they are actually interact with the activated version or in the inactivated version. It's like the example that I pointed out before, I'm entering the room before anyone else enter, I take a photo, then after the people enter uh, the room, I'm taking the same photo and then I can find the differences. So in the case of Keras, to be able to do that, we decided to use two tricks. First one, the environment stimulation. We know that Keras is inactivated in the starvation. So when we starve the cells for overnight, Keras is, is inactivated. And after starvation, if I add some FCS in my medium, then I can activate Keras. So this was one of the ways that we decided to separate the inactivated with the activated Keras. The second way, it was uh, by using some mutants. Keras have some constantly active mutants. These mutants, they cause Keras to stack in the active form. As a result, we can enrich and interact on partners associated with the active Keras. 
Obviously, to be able to do all that, we need to generate some cell lines. For that reason, I decided to use KX293 FRT uh, T-Rex cell lines. So they have the FRT, it means that we can integrate only one locus of our fusion protein and is controlled uh, with tetracycline. So in the absence of tetracycline, we don't have any expressions. We can see here quite nicely that we don't have any uh, background. And in the presence of tetracycline, we have a really nice expression of Keras. So initially we decided to check, is it actually working? Is proxemic labeling working? And then we can show that only in the presence of all the four important elements, which is tetracycline, biodine, H2O2, and the lysate, we have a really nice labeling. And obviously, in the other condition, we have some bands. This is just biodinated proteins that are present inside the Higgs 293 cells. Then we decided to generate the mutants. So here we generate three constantly active mutants, G12D, G13D, and Q61H. And I need to point out here that ERK is a downstream effector of uh, Keras signal. So we know that when Keras is activated, we have the phosphorylation of ERK. And we can see quite nicely here that the three mutants, they have strong activation of the whole pathway. And we can see that after four hours of starvation, the wild type starts slightly, slightly to shut down the pathway, but not the mutants as we expect that. And to even prove that that is associated with our uh, Keras mutants, we perform uh, an IP where we pull down only the active Keras. So this is the total Keras, both inactive and inactivated. And this jelly shows only the active Keras. And we can see obviously, first of all, that the mutants have much more activated version of Keras. And we can see clearly that the wild type, even only four hours after starvation, is completely abolished this active Keras portion. So we was really happy about the cell lines. We just did a last experiment where I have all the cell lines that I generated and I have them in starvation, FCS, or normal condition. We can see that uh, they behave as we expect them. And the important thing here that I want to point out is that the the bionylindase proteins that are present inside different conditions seems to be similar, which is really important for us so we can then perform some quantitative analysis in our data. So we know that the expression is fine. We know that the proteins they behave as we expect them. So the next important thing to be to do proximity labeling is localization. If your protein is located in the wrong place, if you overexpress your protein and start to locate it in different locations, you will make your data much more difficult to analyze them. KRAS is mainly located in the plasma membrane. So what I did, I initially generate a GFP KRAS or just GFP, and I did some microscopy. And we can see quite nicely, as we expect that GFP is located everywhere, where KRAS GFP is located mainly in the plasma membrane. Then, I decided to perform some simple digitonic separation. Digitonic is just make some holes in the cell membrane so we can separate the membrane fraction with the cytosol fraction. And we can see quite nicely that the Keras GFP is mainly located in the membrane, where just the GFP is mainly located in the cytosol. So then I use exactly the same uh, approach to all the Apex2 cell lines that I generate. And we can see quite nice as we expect in Keras is mainly located in the membrane fraction. And we can see even the endogenous Keras, which is assembling the, it shows exactly the same result like the exogenous Keras Apex 2, so we feel quite confident. And obviously I just use some controls to show that the separation works quite well. So then to even valid, validate even more the localization, we decided to perform the Apex 2 labeling, and then we use PB labeling, uh, we use streptavidin AF488 to see actually where the pyrinated proteins are located. And we can see quite nicely in the close picture here that is located into the membrane, but at the same time we have a really strong signal from the nucleus, which we know it's previously reported that Keras could be located in the nucleus, but we don't know if it's just because Keras is located there or some proteins that they previously pyrinated, they just entered the nucleus. It's something that we need to further investigate. The last thing that we decided to do, I already pointed out that one of the tricks that we want to use to separate the active with the inactive Keras is to starve them and then FCS activate them. For that reason, we, al we already know from the literature that when Keras is starved and then FCS in use, it's moving to heavier fractions. So what we perform here, we perform uh, sucrose gradient, um, uh, sucrose fr uh, fractionation. We initially lyse our cells without any detergent, so we can have all the uh, different complexes uh, together, and then we just perform the sucrose screen. We can see quite nicely that uh, Keras Apex is moving to heavier fractions upon stimulation, and it behaves exactly the same way like the endogenous. So that makes us to feel really confident that it behaves the Keras Apex is behave as we expect them. So after that, we was feeling really confident that yes, our cell lines behave as we expect them. Let's do the big Keras interactomic. 
For that reason, we use five different uh, samples. We have the control, which is the wild type KRA, but this time we treat it like all the others with only the exception that we didn't add any tetracycline. So it will not have the affix to KRA there, that, so we don't expect to have any labeling. So we will use that to remove any background. And then we have the wild type with tetracycline, the G12D, uh, G13D, and Q61H. And as I already pointed out, we have two different conditions, two different barometric conditions. One of them, we starve the cells for 16 hours. The second one, we starve the cells for 16 hours, and then we use them with FCS for 10 minutes. And we did all that in three biological replicants. And then we did the proximity labeling. We add biodin for half an hour, H2O2 for 45 seconds. Then we perform the lysate, streptavidin IP on beast digestion, prepare the sample for LS, MS, MS, and then we did our mass spectrometry. We, we used the orbit trap QE, one hour gradient, and we decided to move with label free quantification. Here, I decided initially to show how we analyze our data. We have the raw files that we use mass quant to analyze them, then Perseus, Prism, and R to generate all of our figures. And here I have all the proteins. We identified 4,337 proteins, which is a lot. I you don't expect one protein to interact with 4,000 proteins. So this shows that we have quite high background. And we can see this high background even with the beads. We identified 1,000 proteins uh, just in the negative control beads. And uh, I need to point out here that I wash my beads quite harsh. I use uh, tumular urea and I wash them several times. So we can see that even when you wash them harsh, you still have high background. You need to have that in mind when you planning to perform some proximity labeling experiment. In the rest condition, we have between two to five thousand, two thousand to two thousand five hundred proteins. Initially, we decided to do some clustering to see how different replicants and different conditions they cluster together. It would be really important to make us feel confident that our data is uh, reproducibility and that we have nice the, the biological or the technical variation is not higher than the actual variation that we have from our samples. And we can see that it's clustered quite nicely. We have the controls and even in, in, in the different conditions, we see that some biological replicants start clustering quite well. So we feel confident that we can have some good data there. Then when I saw the, uh, the total proteins that identified, I was worried. I, was, I thought it was too much. So first of all, I used the same uh, algorithm, so I don't have time to introduce that, but it's just uh, an algorithm that is used to identify the true interactome partners. In our case, it's not true interactor because we use proximity labeling, so I, I think it's better to tell them the true proximity labeling proteins is proteins that are close to your bait. It doesn't mean that it's interact yet with your bait. And we did just one D enrichment analysis to try to see how they behave, and we compared them with the um, the proteum that we be before have done in hex 93 cells that we have really nice normal distribution curve, as we expected, where in our data we have two peaks. So we show that we are able to enrich some of the low abundant proteins, which make us feel quite confident that we can capture some of the interactions associated with KRAS. And it's not just random labeling anything that is close there. And then obviously we decided to generate some initial volcano plot. And we tried to check, OK, is KRAS, we have already a lot of known interactions. Let's see, can I identify any of them? And here I have, uh, I compare them with the beats control first. So we have the beats versus the wild type FCS. This is the Keras wild type. And we can see that we have a high proportion of the Keras already known interactome in the enriched fraction. And here we have the beats FCS versus the G12D. As I already pointed out, G12D is a constantly active mutant. And here is really nice to point out, RAF1 is one of the effector proteins of Keras. We know that it's bind with Keras upon activation. And we can see that in the wild type, it's enriched but not significantly enriched, where in the constantly active mutant is significantly enriched. And we expect that. We expect that the constantly active mutant will be strongly binds to uh, the effect of proteins because it's all the time activated where the, the wild type, it doesn't, it, it will be activated and then inactivated. So after that, we decided, okay, we have 13 RAS modulators. Let's do all the volcano plots because we have many different conditions. Let's try to see how they behave. And here we see something really interesting that we actually expected. 
So here is just the wild type starvation, and here is the wild type starvation, so we don't have any comparison, it's the same sample. But in this one, for example, we compare the wild type starvation versus the wild type FCS. And we can see that when I compare the wild type starvation with FCS, some of the effectors produced, they start to move towards the two corners. It shows that KRAS is differently interact with them, but this happens only in the wild type. If we go to the mutants, when we compare them, with the starvation and FCS, we don't see a huge difference. And this is actually what we expect because we know that when we are working with the Keras mutant, the mutation is much stronger than the environmental signal. It doesn't matter if I starve myself or not, Keras will be constantly active. So we don't expect to have any differences in those effector proteins. And then, as I already pointed out, in all these previous volcano plots, we have a lot of proteins. So we need to find a way to try to minimize the background, because if I compare just with the beads, I am enrich all the proteins that are close proximity to KRAS, and we have 500 proteins, so it's, it's a lot. So we decided to start comparing different KRAS conditions. So here we have in the y-axis, the wild type FCS uh, versus the beat FCS fall difference. And on the x-axis, we have the starvation. So we compare first with the bits, and then we compare the two together. So the idea here is if a protein is enriched in a similar way in the two both conditions, it will be 2.2. So when you, you blot the curve, it will be a really nice linear um, line. It will be one to one, two to two, three, three, three. And here we can see that KRAS, as we expect in this our bait, it doesn't change between the two different conditions, it's in the middle. But then we can still see some effective proteins like ARAF, RAF1, mTOR to be enriched in the wild type FCS. And here I need to point out that because of the amount of the proteins that I identified, here I just identified several proteins that are associated with KRAS in its pathway or their two interactors. And I just analyze them those because I try to show first that it's actually working. And then the second comparison that we could do, we compare the starvation FCS induction. Now it's time to compare the wild type with the mutants. So here we have something really interesting. First of all, I need to point out that RAF1, are uh, ARAF and mTOR, we know that is, is some of the effector proteins associated with KRAS. We expect them to interact stronger with the mutants. They are constantly active and we can see that they are enriched. And at the same time, we have LZTR1. LZTR1 is an E3 ligases adapter that previously described to affect the stability of KRAS. And when I was generating all the previous volcano plot, LZTR1 was always enriched in all the different conditions. When I was comparing LZTR1 with the beads, it doesn't matter if it was wild type or mutant, it was always enriched. But here I can see that it seems to interact stronger with the wild type compared to the mutant. And this, it's, the case in all the different mutants is always interacting stronger. So we thought, okay, it's interacting stronger. Does it mean anything biologically? Can we actually validate that through biology? And how we did that? Initially, if you remember, I mentioned that I generate a GFP KRA cell line. So I use this cell line and then I knock down LZTR1 in both the wild type the three mutants and the GFP only cell line. And then I use a microscope to identify the mean fluorescent per well per cell. And here we can see quite nicely that, as we already know from the literature, in the absence of LZTR1, wild type KRAS is stabilized quite well, but not the mutants. The mutants didn't behave like the wild type. It seems that it's affected much less, which is coming consistent to what we saw that it seems that LZTR are interacting stronger. With the, mu with the wild type compared to the mutant. And to even prove that in a Western blood, we perform again Apex2, proximity labeling, and we use ARAF as a control. We expect ARAF to be enriched in the mutants and in the FCS condition. We can see that it's more. And then we compare the LZTR1 expression. We can see that we have much more LZTR1 in the wild type and maybe in the Q61H mutant, which we can see here that it has a medium effect. So it seems that LZTR1 is interact differently and it's affect differently different mutants of KRAS. And obviously we went back to our data and uh, here I need to point out that this is the same scoring 
I need to uh, point out here that uh, in the same scoring, you have uh, a number, a probability from zero to one. One is mean true interaction. Zero is mean that it's not true interacting with your bait, in our case, Keras. And we can see that there is a tier one. It seems to interact strongly. It seems to be a true interaction in the wild type, but not in the mutants. With small expect expectation, uh, um, small difference in the Q61 starvation mode, which seems to interact more. And it's something that we want to investigate more to see why we have these differences with the Q61 uh, mutant. So just to conclude, uh, I think we show that the proximity labeling Apex 2 in our case, it could be a powerful tool to capture some dynamic interactions. But here we need to point out that a successful proximity labeling experiment is depend a lot in the good designing. You need to take into account expression level. You have too high expression of your protein, it will start located in many places, and as a result, it will affect the actual, the true interaction that you expect to see. Localization is another important, important aspect that you need to check. If it's located in the wrong place, then obviously you will pull down proteins that they actually don't make any sense with your bait. Then it will be really nice if you have some different biological stage of your bait. This will help you to start uh, minimizing the actual proteins that you will find. It will help you a lot in your data analysis. And then some ideal controls. For example, you have a stimulus with a naive stage. And regarding KRAS, I think we show that we are able to capture a lot of already known interaction and effectors of KRAS and something unique regarding biology. We just show that LZTR1 seems to affect stronger and interact stronger with the wild type rather than with the mutants. I want to thank you all for your attention. And of course, I need to thank all the people that they helped me during the study, including George B, Julian, and Svenja. And obviously, I need to uh, thank all uh, Adam, Phil, and Benedict for their uh, amazing supervision. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Great talk. Um, so don't forget, people, to um, address your questions to either Andreas or Isabel on the Slack channel. And I'm going to hand over to Karen now to uh, start the Q&A and discussion session. Over to you, Karen. OK, thanks, Joanna. And I'd like to thank the speakers. Those were two great talks, and I really enjoyed listening to them. And I'm going to start off some of the questionings uh, with Isabel. And I'm going to kind of frame it First, with thinking about purifying complexes and the affinity that you would um, need in order to get through the purification. And that matches into some questions that other people have had about your protocol for it to go through this, um, the SEC um, column and then the conditions to ensure the proteins are remain complexed. Um, yes, so... Um Generally, so the the entire protocol is designed in specific um, measures to like, for example, cross-link the proteins, etc. This has also been tried before, but we use just native conditions and we keep the uh, SEC column on ice so that uh, everything's uh, completely uh, cold during the entire processing step. And this is done uh, fairly fast. So they are like the samples don't stand around um, for a long time during the entire processing. And um, this, of course, uh, results <laughs> to, in, in the effect that some, like the more weak um, interactions are not being captured. So we can clearly see that, um, that we can see like really stable protein complexes, complexes but when it gets to like um, like all of these intermediate complexes that you can, for example, capture with Apex, um, uh, we can we cannot see, and uh, this is of course a limitation. Um, but one thing that we uh, usually do to make sure that our conditions were good enough to keep complexes intact is to uh, check the OD two hundred eighty um, uh, profile of the sec fractions that we sampled, and uh, we basically have a reference uh, profile where we know that the like how this should look like and how many proteins should roughly, uh, how much protein content should be in each of the fractions, um, just to see that we have a stable performance and that uh, nothing changed and that the complexes fell apart unexpectedly. So this is mainly what we do. Okay, and just to follow up on that, you, you had reasonably good coverage of known complexes, but do you think a lot of the ones you're missing are ones that would be more membrane associated that your conditions to maintain them. Have you actually checked to see 
because I assume you have that bias in yeah, so out. Have, oh, sorry. Yeah, so we definitely have a bias towards soluble protein complexes. Um, so the strategy to go towards more membrane associated complexes is definitely to uh, perform some cross-linking before you do the fractionation. Um, so this has been done um, in other labs before, uh, where you could see that, um, I don't recall the publication right now, but <laughs> there you could see that um, by performing the cross-linking experiments, you can capture much more of the, of the membrane protein complexes. Uh, but this of course comes again with um, a lot of optimization steps mm -hmm. to actually find the right amount of cross-linking to do. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we, I think Moritz tried this at some point, uh, but we, um, yeah, we thought about uh, sticking to the native protocol for, for, for this point, at this point. Yeah. Okay, so the next question I'll ask is from Tom Ruin, and he has two questions. One is, how do you deal with missing data points in SEC fractions? Does missing values impact complex identification? Yes, so uh, definitely missing values uh, impact complex identification, and this is uh, one of the key reasons why um, DIA performance is so much better than DDA performance, because um, we we get much more complete quantitative profiles. So, um, so this is one of the one of the main advantages of DIA, and that's why we use it. If we have a missing fraction or missing values, we have in CC profiler a function to uh, impute missing values uh, um, if we have values for both the preceding and the following uh, fraction, because then we can be uh, pretty sure that the uh, missing value should lie in between this line because we should have this chromatographic uh, kind of uh, shape. <laughs> and um, so, so there we can impute missing values quite nicely. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a point. Okay, and his second question is, did you try quantifying phosphorylation sites in your SEC fractionation data set? And could you use it to identify phosphocytes that regulate protein complex interactions? Like if the phospho and unmodified phosphopeptides elute differently? I love this question. Um, so this is exactly something that um, uh, I'm, I, I, I did, um, it's not published yet, but <laughs> so we can uh, search for uh, phosphopep or like modified peptides in this data because um, like one nice benefit of using this extensive fractionation is that the uh, samples are not as complex as a normal full lysate. So you can even uh, find um, a good amount of modified peptides in, um, in uh, these uh, full DIA data sets. Um, however, we did it more uh, targeted in a way where we could find for some, um, like basically this polyoform grouping strategy that I briefly showed, uh, there we could see that um, sometimes you see two peaks and in one peak, um, uh, several of the peptides are missing. And we then went back in and uh, performed a targeted analysis to look for uh, phosphopeptides of these uh, missing kind of naked peptides. Uh, and we could see that these that we could actually detect these phosphopeptides, which uh, hints at uh, at these phosphopeptides being specific for a certain protein complex formation, which is really, really exciting. So you, you mentioned the advantages of DIA and Harry had a question about using the advantages. What are the advantages of SWATH DIA? for investigating those and whether it would be better to use a library free approach. So, um, I mean, library free is, a, I, I think this would be great, but I would still stick to uh, DIA, uh, mainly for the reason that um, like of, of consistent sampling, as I said. So you can, like if you, for example, use a direct DIA or like the DI umpire approach, we've done this on, on our data sets and this actually works very nicely. Um, and uh, as I said, this has the benefit of having more complete data matrices as compared to DDA due to the stochastic sampling and the issue of uh, not getting complete profiles in DDA. Um, benefit, other benefits um, I, I think was uh, regarding also modifications, right? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, perhaps you already answered that, but he was wondering about the advantages of using the DIA for that. Yeah, so the, so there, um, 
I, I think it's a, it's a general benefits of DIA, so that this counts uh, like equally for the modified peptides. And you can, of course, always go back, right? So this is the nice thing there. So even if the um, quantities are fairly low, um, if we search for the right things, we can, as, as we did it in this uh, study that I just referred to in the previous question, uh, we can always go back to, DIA, to the DIA data and search for peptides that we didn't look for in the first instance. And this we can, of course, not do in DDA. OK, so just a couple more questions for Isabel. Um, how feasible is it to capture uh, kiss and run protein interactions in macro complexes? Not feasible, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. So this this uh, would need other strategies to uh, somehow um, fix the proteins together um, before separation. Mm -hmm. um, and then one that someone has asked is whether you could use sex swath for studying the composition of membraneless organelles, or would they be too large? Mm. I would think another problem might be the solubilization yeah. of them to start with would be probably the biggest challenge. And as you said before, probably have to go to like a cross link strategy. Yeah. Okay, I have just one question. Not sure if it makes sense, but I'm thinking of it from a biology point of view which is you're using a, a targeted approach to identify complexes. Like, could you subtract every kind of the spectra that you've identified and see if there's potentially any other trends to be identified new complexes, or would that just be too hard computationally? Um, yeah, so we've worked, like, we looked at this a little bit. So what, like, I think the more, like, one promising strategy is to say, to really build on the targeted strategy and like to fi find these kind of seeds of protein complexes that we can uh, detect and then try to uh, identify um, further co-eluting proteins that are potential complex members um, and uh, and this this works fairly nicely um, I think like most of the de novo complex identification strategies are pretty tough. So there are now uh, also a few new strategies out there. So one thing that I think is very promising is to just move from, um, from these fairly defined complex hypotheses that we use most of the time in our complex centric approaches to go to less well defined uh, complex hypotheses. Like if you, for example, expand to the entire string database and, and don't do a complete like boiling down to smaller complexes in the first place. Um, um, one strategy that um, a former colleague of mine, uh, George Rosenberger, is, uh, I mean, it will be published now very soon, it's in press now, um, is a network-centric approach where you basically take an entire protein-protein interaction network, which can also contain a lot of uh, interactions that are not present in the data set, um, to basically way like or find evidence for each of these edges and then uh, kind of dependent on your conditions etc um, figure out what is in there and this is a little bit less defined than the complexes but it's still not taking the entire search space and all of the random uh, potential random coalitions into account okay that's uh, great and exciting so i'm going to move on to some questions now for andreas and one of the first ones is how many cells do you use for your experiments so uh, for the experiment that I show, I use a hundred millimeter dish. And I think this is depending from what type of cells are you planning to use. Uh, so uh, it's something that you need to take in account as well as the proximity labeling uh, efficiency. So different proteins may have different uh, label much less or much uh, more proteins. So you need to take in account that. And here I need to point out that something that I find really interesting is that uh, when I was optimizing my bits, the amounts of the bits that I was planning to use, uh, I find out I did the uh, streptavidin labeling in a Western blot fashion, and I could see that I used 20, uh, 60, and 100. And in 60, I was able to capture everything. So from 60 to 100, I couldn't see any differences in the amount of the biodilation proteins. But when I did the Kumasi stain, I see three, even to fourfold increase in the proteins that I have there. So this shows if you use if you use bits 
uh, more bits, you have much more background. So I think this is another step that you need to optimize. And again, it's depending from uh, experiment to experiment. Different ways, they, they need every time to optimize those stages. Yeah, and I certainly, you know, someone that also does a lot of uh, bio ID, you know, it, all the work you did beforehand to make sure you had everything optimized and localized to the right spot is really critical. And also having the correct controls. Did you do like it didn't seem like you had controls that were like vector only, for instance. Um, so it wasn't clear exactly how you did your SAINT analysis, what you used as your controls for it. So uh, I didn't have uh, a control where I I have just the Apex 2 and the reason that I decided to do that is because Apex 2 is located in other place. So if it's located in the cytosol and I'm using to have a control that is associated in the membrane, I, it will not be appropriated. So I was initially thinking to use a plasma membrane as a control, but at the same time, Keras is one of the proteins that is located in multiple areas. So it's, it's reported to located in the nucleus, in the plasma membrane, in the mitochondria and Golgi. So it, it would be really hard to decide which exactly it would be the control. So I decided just to have as a control only the bits. So in that case, I'm removing at least the background of the bits. And this is what I use for my same scoring. And then I decided that I would use the different condition of KRAS to try to see the enrichment of interaction associated with specific condition or the mutants. Okay, and when someone else just, um, uh, Harry asked, when you activate the biotin tag, how far does it diffuse away from the target? So uh, this is, uh, in the literature, you can find between uh, five to 20 nanometers. So it's, it's something that it, I, I was even reading a paper uh, last, I think it was a month ago that is published that they actually did the, perform the Apex 2 uh, after they fixed the cells because it was claiming that they could see uh, much less uh, background. So it's, it's, I think it's, they said between five to 20, but it's still there is uh, ways to improve, like fix the cells first and then perform the Apex 2 labeling. Okay. And another question is, have you considered using D DIA to help you um, with your data acquisition and any missing values you may be finding when you're comparing conditions? Yes, I was thinking that uh, it's something that I will definitely uh, use possibly to check if it's better or not in some other uh, Apex to labeling that I'm planning to do. But at the moment, no, I didn't use it. OK, and do you have any uh, big issues with the uh, streptavidin on bee digestion? In the background, did you modify the beads in any way? Uh, well, to be honest, initially uh, I was I was a little bit worried because I was thinking that maybe the peptides that they actually put in is maybe they stuck uh, in the beads. So I perform uh, I compare uh, where I did just the illusion using a uh, loading buffer, and then I did pre protein precipitation, so then uh, digestion, and then I perform on this digestion. And when I compare these two conditions, I couldn't see a significant difference on the heat. Uh, in both uh, peptides and uh, in protein levels. So I thought that is working quite well. So just, just a note on that, I work with Anne-Claude Gingra at the Lunenfeld and they published a paper over the summer and it was the quality of the streptavidin beads were really important and changed the background. We had a particularly bad batch. Um, so um, this paper describes, you know, the need to do kind of a QC on your batches and make sure that you introduce them and there's not any increase in background. So that's just a note out related to that. Um, so I find it very exciting. One of the things, of course, you can do with the short labeling with Apex, for instance, is any is time courses um, of stimulation. So have you thought or are planning to do things where you might use either like EGFR or or PD, PDGF, uh, PD, sorry, PDGF or EGF to stimulate um, your cells and do time courses and see how things change and if there's any. Um... It's a great, great uh, question, suggestion. Yes, I thought that and I think this will help even more to uh, to analyze the data because if you have a problem that is increasingly interacting with the active side and you have all the intermediates, you can have a curve that you can see this increase in the interaction. So it will make me feel more confident that is associated with that is not just random, especially when we go to the low abundant proteins, which is, seems to be some important regulators. So I think that this is a great idea and this is something that uh, I'm planning, uh, I, I would like to do. 
Yeah, because a lot of the exciting thing too is you can see different waves of proteins that will come on and off together um, that start giving you insight into some of the biology and these fast um, uh, apex plus the new turbos for BioID can give you that. OK, I think that's um, all the questions that um, are through through the slacks. Thanks for people for entering them. And it was a, a great uh, Q&A session and I really enjoyed uh, the interactions and the, the talks from the speakers. And I will pass it on to Joanna now. Thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks to both Isabella and Andreas for a really exciting uh, discussion and talks. Um, so now we are um, going to move on to handing over um, to Simon from the Young Proteomics Investigators Club to announce the winner of uh, the fourth mini challenge and the grand prize challenge uh, draw. So he'll also obviously be giving you the answers. Uh, it's over to you, Simon, if you can take control and uh, switch on your mic. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect, I will just, and can you see the slides? Yes. All right, that's good. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is Simon and I'm here on behalf of the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, as already mentioned, to uh, present to you the winners of the mini challenge, the fourth mini challenge, and of course, uh, the grant uh, prize uh, challenge, which uh, which combines the, the four challenges. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking the two speakers uh, for the great Q&A and the great webinars they gave today. Uh, but I also would like to thank uh, the London Proteomics Discussion Group uh, for the collaboration over the past uh, months. It was nice uh, to do this. Uh, and of course, uh, our sponsor Matrix Science uh, is also a great thanks. Uh, the first, the fourth mini challenge, you can see it uh, right here on my slide, uh, consisted of three peptide Y-ion uh, series uh, in one uh, spectrum. There was one rescued in red, and uh, it was up to the challenges, uh, challenges to uh, give us uh, the right uh, peptides. Uh, the solution was, of course, thanks you all uh, for obvious reasons, LPDG and YPIC and uh, mini challenge. There were quite some uh, submissions, of which five were in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, the first one was uh, Bharat Kumar, from uh, Max Planck Institute for uh, Molecular Cell Biology and uh, Genetics, but uh, Hrit uh, de Beyser from Research Institute for Chromatography Belgium was just one minute later, so we decided to give them both a 10 pound voucher because it might have been that there were some email issues or whatever. Uh, and then we also selected uh, a random winner, which is uh, Ignacio Ortea, from the Biomedical Research Institute of Cadiz in Spain. So congratulations to these three winners. We will contact you through email to give you the 10 pound uh, voucher. But then of course, uh, more important is the grand prize, which consisted of a, a, a crossword puzzle, as you can see here, for which you needed the, four, uh, the solutions of the previous four uh, mini challenges, as you can see. And uh, we were looking for one of the most popular sentences in uh, 2020. Uh, important also was the, the hints that you could see, which were coordinates for uh, a headquarters of the Zoom video communications, with, which could uh, help you to find this sentence. Please, uh, please unmute yourself, uh, which uh, is of course uh, used a lot uh, these days, uh, especially uh, in, in webinars and stuff like that. Uh, there were some uh, a lot of a lot of submissions, but only three of them were uh, honorably mentioned here because they looked quite similar to what we were uh, hoping to see. Uh, Barat found, uh, please don't mask yourself, but that was not correct. Uh, Grit de Beyser found, uh, please unmask yourself, and uh, of course the winner, Daniel Rothenberg from BioNTech US, found, please uh, unmute uh, yourself. So the winner is uh, Daniel uh, Rothenberg. I would like to thank uh, the London Proteomics Discussion Group uh, once more uh, for the collaboration and of course uh, Matrix Science for sponsoring us. Back to you, Joanna. Uh, thanks Simon and congratulations to all the winners. Um, so 
As mentioned earlier, we will have a form just at the end for those requiring certificates of attendance, uh, which will just be available for a few minutes after we wrap up. So I'd just like to thank again our speakers, our guest chair and uh, Simon from YPIC and Matrix Science for sponsoring today's challenge and to everyone for coming along and our sponsors and those committee members who are working away in the background to make this webinar possible. And that's it from the LPDG for this year. Thanks everyone for joining us with our webinar series and for all your support. We'll be updating our social media pages and website with plans for the new year. So don't forget to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook and join our mailing list to keep up to date. In the meantime, thanks again all for joining. Have a great weekend and holiday break and uh, see you in 2021 when we'll hope to be able to meet again in person. So thank you very much.